I'm Wendy Gibson. I am from the Air Force Whiskers Laboratory and Materials and Manufacturing Directorate. And I wanted to thank the organizers for putting on a great symposium and for inviting me to talk today. I have to say that the interaction piece has really come off really well. It's always a little scary as a as a scientist when you walk into a restaurant and you have place cards on the table. Um, but that was phenomenal for encouraging interactions, and I definitely talked to a whole lot more people than I would have otherwise. So thanks for that in particular. Um, so I, before I go any further, I also want to thank members of my team. So I have a fabulous team. Um, my bio-corrosion and biofiling research team in the Materials and Manufacturing Directorate. A lot of very dedicated people who do a lot of hard work on this project. Um, our collaborator on, on this project, as well as in our um, biofuel fouling project, is um, Brad Stevenson. He's sitting in the back from the University of, of Oklahoma. He has a poster. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to see that, too, because we work together on, on both of these projects. Brad's lab brings the microbial community ecology piece and the microbial physiology piece to the to the programs and uh, my team has some more microbial physiology but also understanding of bacterial and fungal and material interactions and um, biodegradation. And I'd also like to thank the U.S. Air Force System program offices and their personnel for the access to some of these systems. So I wanted to show you what microbiology looks like from my perspective in the Air Force. It's, it's much different, I think, than some of the other things that we've seen. This picture here on the left-hand side is what's known as a 12 by 12 compartment. I have no idea why it's called that because it's actually not 12 feet or 12 inches, but it's about the width of my shoulders and about six feet long. It's defined as a confined space as far as Air Force terminology. And the reason why that's really important is because some poor soul has to go into that compartment, shimmy his way into or her way back into that compartment to service those hydraulic lines. And so literally, you are nose to nose with a whole heck of a lot of microbiology in a case like this. Not a very fun place to be. Um, these two other pictures come from cargo aircraft. In one case, we have the floor and insulation, which is very well contaminated with fungal um, contaminants. This is an avionics bay that also has a lot of contamination. So when people pick up the phone and call us and ask and say, we have this mass contamination problem, what do we do about it? It's not necessarily, um, they're not thinking, what, well, their concern is their health. They're worried about maintenance crews and flight crews and their exposure to these things. And that certainly is an issue, but it's actually not what I work on. So when I crawl into this space, this is what concerns me. Um, this is a perfect example of fungal degradation of the coating system within those confined spaces. So we have fungal organisms that are literally eating their way through the coatings in these compartments. And the reason why that's an issue is because if they get through that stack of coatings, um, they will eventually start to corrode the, the, the alloys underneath the aircraft. And then we've got further issues in terms of corrosion and structural concerns for their that um, particular aircraft. So in general, the Air Force or anybody else for that matter doesn't like when uh, you know, airplanes fall out of the sky. It's not a really good thing. Um, so there's a safety risk there. But in addition, um, corrosion in the Air Force is a $6 billion problem. So that's you know your taxpayer money going to fight stuff like this. So you know there's a significant, um, many significant reasons why we should care about this. So my lab has spent uh, the last eight years doing some pretty fundamental research on how polyurethane degradation happens. Um, so this is funded by AFOSR, and we do this in collaboration with some folks um, at the Naval Research Laboratory. So we've established some pretty good biofilm-based uh, degradation assays. We know that this process is kicked off by secretion of esterases and lipases by the bacteria and fungi. We know in the case of Pseudomonas that it's regulated by carbon metabolic progression. So basically an organism starts, when it's starting to starve, it will start to secrete these enzymes that then um, can, can access it for nutrients. Um, we also know that the, the ability of the organism to degrade the polyurethane um, is a back and forth relationship with the coating chemistry. So because esterases and lipases are the things that degrade um, polyester, polyurethanes are more susceptible than polyethers. And more recently, we're doing some pretty cool studies on, on kind of feedback between the coating and the degradation of the coating and the organism. So you start to degrade the, ODE, the coating, you get some degradation products and metabolites, so those further feed the population 
or do they stop that population dead in its tracks? So thinking about how to design coatings to, to prevent this kind of thing that aren't necessarily um, traditionally thought of as, as biocidal. So the reason why I say this is because it gives us an ability to look when we're looking into the environment to understand we, we have a background level understanding of what the mechanisms are that these uh, organisms are using to degrade. So when we go into these systems, we want to answer a lot of questions that um, a lot of the other speakers have posed already. Who's there? Very particularly, how many are there? That's really important to us. If we're going to mitigate anything like this, we need metrics to know how many are there and what are the consequences of those particular um, loads of bacteria and fungi in the system. What are they capable of? What are the key drivers of this kind of degradation? So what are the metadata, as we were talking about in our built environment break, uh, breakouts, water, humidity, temperature, that are driving this? And then once we have an understanding of that, how can we mitigate the system? So we undertook a microbiome survey of five U.S. Air Force cargo aircraft. These were all stationed at the same Air Force base in southern uh, United States. We sampled 16 locations per aircraft, and the areas that we sampled um, were definitely areas that we often would see contamination, but they were also representative areas that we didn't, so corroded versus non-corroded areas, frequent human contact points as another uh, point of reference, um, controls, and we sampled a variety of different materials from coated and non-coated aluminum, wiring insulation, which is another polymer, fabrics, plastics, staining fluids, etc. And so what we did was um, to swab a three by three inch area, and then we do um, 16S, 18S RDNA sequencing um, on samples from uh, one of those, or three of those swabs, and then took the rest for cultivation. So the cultivation piece is also a really important piece of what, we're, what we do because it allows us to ascribe function to this um, microbiome community. So here are some of the community data um, separated out either by tail number, that is by, indiv by individual aircraft. So we ask the question, does the microbiology, uh, microbiota, um, is it similar on um, per aircraft or across um, different aircraft? And it, and it um, it appears that the tail number, the individual aircraft, there's there's no um, similarity in that. If you look at it that way, but if you look at it by location, um, this is where you start to see a little bit of breakout, breakout as you would expect. Um, particularly in the in the case of the green, this human associated microbiota that comes off of the flight controls and handles and stuff like that, it distinguishes itself from the rest of the aircraft. What's also um, kind of ground proofing of all this is these other three circles, the orange uh, and the yellow in particular. These are samples from the inside of the aircraft versus the outside. And it turns out, as you might expect, in a cargo aircraft that is transporting um, the vehicles and other equipment that comes in from the outside, the outside of the aircraft and the inside of the aircraft actually look pretty similar. So that makes sense. The fungi um, are a little bit different here. We do see that maybe threads of things starting to break out aircraft by aircraft. Um, we'd like to follow up on that a little bit. Um, and uh, less, less breakout um, in terms of location of the aircraft. So when we cultivate off these aircraft, in this particular case, we isolate 646 different uh, organisms from this aircraft. I'm not gonna go into what they all were. I have a long list if anybody's interested in looking at it, but they are a combination of human, animal, and plant pathogens, um, which suggests that these aircraft are, could be vectors for transmission of all these kinds of things all around the world. Um, we also see um, basic soil and marine microbiology present. So, uh, one of the other questions that we'd like to answer is how many are there? Another really important question to us. And you'd think that doing QPCR on these communities would be fairly straightforward, but in fact it's not. First of all, we've got hundreds and hundreds of samples, so you know that's a lot of work. But even um, more in addition to that, the fungi are really hard to work with. Of course, there's not always the same copy number of 18S um, species to species or um, genera to genera. And we also have this complicating problem where something like Orium decidium, which is a, a you know, sends out these hyphae all over the place. They're multi-septated, so they're multi-nucleated, so how do you count that? Is that one organism, or is that many organisms? And so we have to understand 
a little bit more about the biology before we can go back and do QPCR on this. So really what we're stuck with is cultivation. And so the way we choose to do this is by basically creating this heat map of the aircraft. So here all those, um, each of the five boxes represent the tail number. And then we can go back and when we first played it out the samples, we did serial dilutions. But then we can go back and ascribe a number of microbial load to that particular part of an aircraft. So the heat map, the hotter you are, the more microbiology there is in a certain area. And when you start to roll up all these results, you start to see that there are cool spots, so places where we don't usually cultivate things, and then hot spots in the aircraft. So if I overlay the PDA and the TSA results and I and I look at this as one big picture, you start to see that there are certain areas of the aircraft that really jump out as to having characteristically high microbial loads. And as we also talked about in the breakout session, what distinguishes these four places in particular is the presence of water. Um, and so in the case of those corroded floorboards, they're right underneath the windows on the flight deck that leak all the time. In the case of the D-rings, these are little rings that sit on the cargo bay floor, and you probably can't see in this picture, but there's a puddle in the middle of that D-ring. Um, and then, uh, you know, these doors are opening and closing all the time, sometimes during flight, if people are jumping out of the aircraft, there's a lot of wetness in that environment. And then dry bays, despite their name, are actually pretty wet places. There, there's a lot of condensation that happens in them. There are um, access points for um, servicing the, the engines and the fuel lines, and so there's a lot of great um, uh, aerosolized organic materials that can feed the bacteria and fungi as well as um, condensation to keep them alive and well. Okay, so now we're in the function piece. We know, you know, there are these hot spots on the on the airplane. Um, we know what kind of uh, isolates we have to deal with. The question is, are they doing anything? Are those the hot spots significant? for hotspots for degradation too. And so we interrogate all 646 isolates by doing the screening assay for polyurethane deterioration. So basically we have a plate, we impregnate it with oil polyurethane, we inoculate the plate, and then we look for these zones of clearings around colonies. And after doing that squeak screen, we see about 10% of those, poly of those um, isolates are polyurethane degraders. So um, also part of our AFOSR effort, we can spend some time trying to understand under what conditions these organisms grow and under what conditions they, they degrade. And I won't say anything more about that other than there's a surprising number of psychophilic organisms on these aircraft. You might not expect that, but they're very active at low temperatures and degrading at low temperatures. But when you roll up, again, all of these different isolates and start looking for commonalities, what you see is that same organisms start popping up over and over again. And so organicidium, always, um, always a really great polyurethane degrader. Cryptococcus species are everywhere. They're also very potent degraders in pseudomonas as far as bacteria goes. And so what do we do with this information? Well, this is when we can go back and interrogate our 16S and 18S data to try and figure out how we can correlate those hotspots with the presence of these particular genera in those hotspots. And so what you see down here is each, each one of these, again, is a tail number. And then we've got a, a layout of the relative abundance of these particular organisms within that particular hotspot. So we can really, truly see that now D-rings are definitely a hotspot for Oreocidium. Um, but we do want to kind of ground proof this again. And so if we overlay our, our cultivation data on top of this now, what you see is that you know now, now you've got um, some kind of, uh, uh, maybe a breakdown of fidelity, or maybe this is representing the fact that we've got dead organisms there. So either we're, we're failing to cultivate um, some of these act, active polyurethane degraders from some areas, but we're cultivating them from other areas. And so it's really important for us to, to try and connect the function of this, the activity of this, to, to the overall uh, picture of these hotspots. So, uh, with that, where does that leave us? You know, in the Air Force, Army, and Navy, we want actionable items. We want returns on investments. We want to know um, if we're trying to make a difference that we've actually made a difference. And um, so, you know, given everything that I've said, obviously we have a lot of gaps in what we're doing. We're not to the point where I can go out and tell the maintenance community, listen, you need to apply a bicycle paint in a particular area because it's, it's going to be a corrosive area. 
And I'm not really to the point where I can say, um, you know, perform this type of pre preventative maintenance at this particular interval. So I did want to spend two seconds here just talking about the gaps and why we can't do that. And this speaks to, you know, some of the things that we were also talking about in the breakout session. I think we're pretty good as far as being able to get a picture of who's there, both cultivation-wise and sequencing-wise. The real true gaps are down here in this red box of, of really finding out how many organisms are there. You really have to use a combination of techniques. Um, cultivation doesn't give you all the answers. Obviously, you can't cultivate everybody from there. I didn't really talk about this much, but we've done ATP measurements on surface. Not great either. Not very quantitative. Um, to, you know, it's representative or not of my, uh, metabolic activity. We've had a lot of issues um, making um, those two measurements agree with one another. Um, and then we've got qPCR. Again, very labor intensive. It also has its drawbacks as far as um, using 18S to do that qPCR. And finally, the most important piece as far as I'm concerned, what are they capable of? So, you know, we can, we can do our lab studies, um, wind that back to cultivation. Um, we're interested in applying some metagenomics, and we know those the enzymes that are supposed to be active, so can we find them in the, in the metatranscriptome from these areas, look for those esterases and lipases. Um, and finally, the, the piece that's always very helpful is if we can do these in situ measurements of biodegradation. So we've done this very successfully in the fuel systems because they'll let us put coupons down in the fuel systems. A lot, of, a lot harder to convince people to fly coupons around on the operational aircraft. So with that, I'd just like to say thanks again, um, and I'm happy to take questions during, the, during lunch or break.